Well, hey, it's Tuesday, October the 7th. My name is Jonathan. I'm the pastor of Renewed Life Church, and I wanted to remind you of why I began to do these Bible prophecy updates. I wanted to enter the conversation, the Bible prophecy conversation, by getting us to point to Scripture, getting us in Scripture, examining and studying the Word of God so that we can begin to really look at the events that are happening around the world through a lens of Scripture. I hear a lot of things thrown out. Is this the Psalms 83 war? Is Isaiah 17 fulfilled? Or is that a future prophecy? Is this Ezekiel 38, 39? And what I wanted to do was begin to supplement the conversations that are happening in the Bible prophecy community, especially here locally, to begin to point us back to Scripture. Let's get into Scripture. Let's examine and study Scripture together so that we can have a better understanding of God's Word, His heart, His nature, His character, and what He has planned for the future of this world, all to bring Himself glory. And if we can do that together, we can begin to see the events of this world through a lens of Scripture in a better, more accurate way. Uh, and it'll grow us in our, our, our understanding of God. It'll grow us in relationship with Him by His Spirit through the Word of God. Um, and it'll really just encourage and edify us in this time, this chaotic time. Today is going to be no different. We're going to talk about the rapture of the church. That is a hot button topic in the Christian community. Uh, when you start to talk about rapture, there are so many different doctrinal stands on the rapture. Is that a literal event that's going to take place in the future? Um, is the rapture or the timing of the rapture pre-trib or mid-trib or pre-wrath or post-trib? Um, and we'll, we'll begin to talk about some of those things today. Um, and I hope that Traveling through God's Word will help to establish our understanding of the rapture of the church and what the Bible clearly teaches about that future event. But first, I want to talk about what is going on or what is continuing to uh, happen there in the Middle East and Israel in the Gaza Strip um, and, and the nations surrounding Israel and what's been happening there um, over the last several days. What's interesting, even this morning as I look at reports there on the ground from the front lines, the Israelis, the IDF, have moved into Gaza, have taken up uh, significant ground in Gaza, have surrounded really Gaza City from three different uh, sides, and have split the north part of Gaza from the south part of Gaza. I talked about hostage rescue, and I talked about separating hostages from a hostage taker. And when I, when I create that separation through a, a tactical mean, through any uh, creative tactical means, I can exploit that moment of opportunity, move in and remove that hostage from the hostage taker, and have a successful hostage rescue. Well, the other part of hostage rescue, the other part of that tactical operation is establishing a corridor. I want to establish a corridor and I wanna to begin to move innocent civilians, um, unknowns, uh, potential hostages from one area, one danger area to a, a safer area. And what's interesting is all the conversation that is happening right now, we're missing what's happening actually in Gaza. The, the Israelis, the IDF, have set up this corridor and are beginning to move more and more people from North Gaza to South Gaza. And that corridor, what that allows them th to do through uh, armored personnel carriers, tanks, uh, troops on the ground, it allows them to cover and protect the movement of innocent hostages, innocent victims, unknowns from that northern area of Gaza to a more safe place in southern Gaza. They're covering that movement for a reason. They're covering the movement of those peoples 
because they are protecting them, keeping them safe from Hamas. That is a tactical movement, an intentional, methodical, tactical movement that has to take place during hostage rescue that's so amazing to watch. Um, it is very much um, indicative of, it speaks to really the, the consideration that the Israelis are having over the Palestinian people there in Gaza and trying to separate them uh, as much as they can from the Hamas, from the terrorists, from the, the organization that has uh, really developed into an enemy of Israel, of the Jewish people, over years and years and years. Um, so they are making a significant impact in that area. And from those, those frontline footholds, those strongholds that they have, they are able to carry out operations and they are also able to protect the movement of innocent victims, hostages, unknowns from that northern uh, focal battle uh, uh, campaign there in North Gaza to the south. So it's, it's pretty neat to watch that on the news. But uh, Secretary Blinken was there over the last uh, week just making a really this campaign run going around and visiting uh, first in Israel, then going and meeting with the Palestinian president um, in the West Bank and, and beginning to meet with Jordanians and Egyptians and, and, and um, leadership from Qatar or Qatar um, and, and beginning to really voice or express concern and a desire to implement some sort of humanitarian pause, like a tactical pause, like a timeout. Um, I talked about this before and how, how silly it is for us from America to begin to call, you know, a timeout from, from you know, very far away from the, the battlefield, very, very much removed from the front lines, the troops on the ground, the boots on the ground, the leadership there in Israel who are conducting military operations in country and, and from a different country, we are going to begin to call for timeout, for a tactical pause, for a humanitarian pause. And what was interesting to me is when Blinken was, was really presenting this, he's talking about a humanitarian pause to accomplish some sort of mission objective. You know, we wanna put uh, resources inside of Gaza, uh, humanitarian aid, or we can possibly remove hostages during these, these humanitarian pauses or tactical pauses that we're calling for. He was expressing this and, and really voicing this to journalists, to media, during different interviews, and it was almost as if he is able to voice this humanitarian pause on both sides. Like we're gonna get the Israelis, the IDF, we're gonna get Benjamin Netanyahu, everybody to agree to this. And we're also going to somehow get the Hamas leadership, the terrorists there to agree to these humanitarian pauses so that we can create this, this opportunity in time to accomplish a, an objective, a humanitarian objective, either bringing goods in or removing hostages from and he was speaking almost like he could negotiate this between both sides. And I just thought that very interesting because on the Hamas side of things, on the terrorist side of things, there is no agreement to a tactical pause, a humanitarian pause. Hey, we're going to stop the fighting. Uh, their goal and objective is backed by an Islamic ideology that is completely opposed to the Jewish people. They are actually opposed to anybody on the outside of themselves, meaning uh, America would fit in there with, with the, a nation that they are against. They do not want Jewish people. They do not want American people. They want to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. They want to remove them from the map. Um, and they want to do that to America as well. So I just thought that very interesting. It's almost like this, um, 
you know, American arrogance that our leadership has right now, you know, where we would begin to think that we could somehow reach in and influence both sides of this conflict. Like we can control from America a, a tactical or humanitarian pause on the battlefield so that we can accomplish a humanitarian objective and make everybody feel better about it. And again, I just want to voice, you know, last week I said, man, I was actually pleased with and, and at least acknowledging the fact that our uh, administration here in America was not calling for a ceasefire. Now they've come up with this different language, this different lingo. There's a humanitarian pause that is being requested at different times. Again, almost like they can control both sides of the conflict. Um, and I just think this is very silly. Um, it is very arrogant to, to think that we can control what is going on there on the ground, boots on the ground, trusting that the, the very competent uh, Israeli army, the IDF, and all of the resources that they have they are capable of accomplishing their mission. Um, I also have been watching on the news and, and never thought that I would see this in my lifetime. And maybe that's complacency on my part, spiritual complacency, uh, biblical complacency, you know, understanding what the Bible says about the future, but really not uh, believing, you know, in my lifetime that I would see some of these things you know, hoping to see them, uh, wanting to see the will of God fulfilled on this earth, but really, I think complacently, you know, not believing that these things would, would happen so quickly. As I've been watching the news, especially, you know, national news here in the United States, um, I just find it very interesting that we are having so many conversations about the nations that are surrounding, that are unifying against Israel. We're constantly watching this center uh, focal point Israel. We're zooming in on Israel and we're looking at all the countries surrounding her and how they are completely opposed to anything that she is doing anything that the Israeli army is doing, and there seems to be this ring around Israel that is pointing in towards Israel and are defiantly opposed to what Israel is doing in response to the terrorist attack uh, to their country on October the 7th. Um, and I just think that that is very interesting. As I watch the news and I see this unfolding, I am believing every single day, more and more and more, as we watch things unfold there on the front lines, that God is supernaturally and strategically moving all of the places, or, or the pieces into place, rather, uh, to accomplish His plan, His purpose, His will for this earth, for this planet, all again. And we have to say this as much as we can. It is all to bring Himself glory. It is all to point people to Himself. It is all so that people will know and understand who He is and that salvation has been accomplished for this world through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Speaking of our Savior, um, I love the topic of the rapture. I love talking about the rapture of the church. Uh, here's a spoiler alert for you. I believe and hold to a pre-tribulational rapture uh, doctrine. I believe Scripture, when you look at the totality of Scripture from cover to cover, I believe Scripture teaches a pre-trib rapture of the church. And I believe it's beautiful. I believe it's encouraging. I believe it's very helpful. But as we start to look at Scripture and examine Scripture and move through Scripture, really informing us and helping us learn better the doctrine of the rapture. I want to say this. There are brothers and sisters in Christ who hold to rational or rational rapture opinions or doctrines that are um, 
different than, than mine, that are different than yours perhaps, that's okay. We need to be okay with that. We need to understand there are people who are learning and, and, and trying and striving day in and day out to follow our Savior, to follow Christ, uh, to evangelize the lost, to share the name of Jesus Christ with their relational circles. We have brothers and sisters in Christ who are about the good work of our God uh, who hold to a different uh, uh, rapture doctrine than ours uh, or, or yours, um, uh, especially mine. I understand that and I accept that. That doesn't mean that they are bad. That doesn't mean that they are off. That doesn't mean that they are avoiding or ignoring Scripture. That doesn't mean that I can elevate myself to a position of superiority over them and look down on them as if they have not arrived yet. Um, I can say though that we have plenty of time to convince them that they are wrong. And I'm, I'm totally kidding about that. But we need to love um, other followers of Jesus Christ who hold to a different rapture doctrine or opinion or perspective than ours. It's okay. Um, it is certainly okay. And we can begin to examine Scripture and really allow Scripture to infuse or inform what we understand about the rapture, what we understand about or hold to about the rapture. Uh, but all of that starts with this time of tribulation, this seven-year tribulation period that is going to come upon this earth in the future. That time of tribulation, it's actually not titled in Scripture as the tribulation, but many uh, refer to that time as the tribulation. Um, it's actually called the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, the 70th week of Daniel. And when we begin to examine what that time is and what the reason or, or the reason behind that time that God is going to use that that time for, when we examine the why behind that 70th week of Daniel, that time of tribulation, Jacob's trouble that will come upon this earth where God will focus in on the Israelites, when we begin to examine that time and understand the why behind it, it helps us begin to shape and understand the doctrine of the rapture uh, that is taught throughout Scripture. Um, it helps us understand the, the rapture in a more significant and fulfilling way, I believe. So let's start with that. Let's start with looking at this time of Jacob's trouble, uh, the tribulation, um, the 70th week of Daniel. Let's look at that. Let's start with Jeremiah chapter 30, verse number 7. And it says this, how awful that day will be. There will be no other like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob, but he will be saved out of it. So we see this time of trouble that is for Jacob. That is speaking of the Israelites. That is for Israel, God's chosen people, his inheritance, his special possession, as Scripture refers to the Israelites um, this time is when God will focus in on the Israelites. Uh, later in that chapter, Jeremiah 30, verse number 23, it says, Look, a storm from the Lord, wrath has gone out, a churning storm. It will whirl about the heads of the wicked. The, lo the, the Lord's burning anger will not turn back until he has completely fulfilled the purposes of his heart. In time to come, you will understand it. When we begin to talk about this time of Jacob's trouble and understanding God is going to use this future time, this future event to focus in on Israel and his chosen people, we have to begin to understand the prophet Daniel and the prophecy or the vision given to Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 and understanding how this was given to Daniel for his people about this nation. And if we look at that, Daniel chapter 9, 
starting in verse 24, we get a, a little bit more detail of that time of Jacob's trouble. Verse 24 says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city. So again, talking to Daniel, your people being the Israelites and your holy city, zooming in on and focusing in on Jerusalem. 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to bring the rebellion to an end, to put a stop to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Know and understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until an anointed one, the ruler will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be re rebuilt with a plaza and a moat, but in difficult times. After those specific now 62 weeks, after those 62 weeks, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the coming ruler will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come with a flood, and until the end there will be war. Desolations are decreed. So we see right away, this is focusing in on Daniel, his people, his holy city, Jerusalem. There's a time frame that is given. We have a total of 70 weeks, and then it's divided up. Those 70 weeks are divided up in three different parts. First, we see uh, seven weeks, and then we see 62 weeks. After those 62 weeks, there's specific things that Daniel is told that are going to happen in the future. One, Jesus is going to be crucified. Uh, two, the people of the coming ruler during that time will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So the temple there is going to be destroyed. The end will come with a flood, and until the end there will be war, desolations are decreed. So right now, that's where we find ourselves on the uh, biblical prophetic timeline of God. We are in that time after those 62 weeks. So Jesus has been crucified. He has gone to the cross. He has gone to the grave and he has been raised to life um, after appearing to uh, many, many, many people over the period of 40 or so days. He ascends to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Um, about A.D. 70, we see the temple, Jerusalem, uh, being invaded and the temple being destroyed. And then we see wars, desolations, all of these things happening, and all of this, it says, will continue to happen until the end. So we have a seven-week seven time uh, that is given. We have 62 weeks that are given. And then we're waiting on that final 70th week. Verse 27, Daniel 9, he will make a firm covenant with many for one week. There's our final 70th week. This he who will make a firm covenant is speaking of the Antichrist. But in the middle of the week, in the middle of that final 70th week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and offering. The interesting thing about that is we know a temple has to be built. If he is going to interrupt or stop sacrifice, um, there has to be a temple where he is going to enter, uh, defile, uh, interrupt or stop the sacrifices and set up this abomination of desolation. It says there, and the abomination of desolation will be on a wing of the temple until the decreed description destruction is poured out on the desolator. So this 70th week of Daniel is focusing in now on Israel. It's on focusing in on Daniel's people and the holy city there, Jerusalem, where the temple was. Um, it's focusing in on a future temple that will be established during that 70th week and the abomination of desolation that will be set up there on a wing of the temple. 
uh, Jesus refers to this in the Olivet Discourse. In the Olivet Discourse, he says, hey, when you, now focusing in on the Israelite people, when you see this, when you, when you look at this and that, that temple that is built, uh, the Antichrist enters this temple, puts a stop to sacrifice, and sets up the abomination of desolation there on a wing of, a t- of the temple. Jesus says, when you see this, as spoken of by the prophet Daniel, when you see this, you need to flee. You need to get out of there. You need to run. Um, he's, he's speaking of this time that is going to intensify. This, this time of Jacob's trouble, the 70th week of Daniel. And he says about that in the Olivet Discourse that this is going to be the worst time in human history uh, and there will never be another time like this. So this is a significant single moment in the history of humanity and it's going to be the worst time that has ever come upon uh, the people on this earth and there will never be a time like it. So it's, it's a singular event that Jesus is speaking of. When he points back to the abomination of desolation as spoken of by the prophet Daniel, he's wanting the Israelites to understand, hey, this is about you. This is, uh, these 70 weeks have been decreed, Daniel, about you, your people, the holy city. So this is all about the Israelites. This is about uh, what is going on in country there, in Israel, in Jerusalem. Uh, And Jesus, during the Olivet Discourse, is focusing in on the Israelites, the Jewish people, and what is taking place there in the future in country. Many people want to use the Olivet Discourse and say, hey, this is where we need to go for rapture doctrine, rapture teaching. But this is speaking, the Olivet Discourse is speaking of the second coming of Christ. That is a different event than the rapture of the church. So, When we go to the Olivet Discourse and we begin to look at Scripture there, talking about the sign that appears in the sky, Him coming on the clouds, mourning over Him, all of that is speaking to Israel, to the Israelites, and focusing in on them. We can't use that passage of Scripture, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, we can't use the Olivet Discourse then to frame or form the rapture of the church. Um, if, if we really begin to examine the Olivet Discourse, the rapture of the church is not taught there. So then we have to ask the question, okay, if that's not taught in the Olivet Discourse, is, if the rapture of the church is not talked about, um, and if it's talking really about the suddenness of, of the second coming, the suddenness of the destruction that happened as compared to the flood, um, if that's what it's talking about, and it's not talking about the rapture, then where does Jesus teach the doctrine of the rapture? And if you go to John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, it is such a beautiful time when Jesus teaches this most wonderful doctrine, the rapture of the church, His coming back for the church, for Christians, and taking us to be with Him. Um, I was listening to to Pastor Jack uh, Hibbs, and He said this one time, hey, if you don't believe in the rapture, if you are a Christian, a follower of Jesus, and you don't believe that there is a literal rapture of the church, you need to take John 14, 1 through 3, and you need to get some scissors and cut that out of your Bible. And I agree with him on that. If we ignore these three verses, these significant three verses, we are going to miss the rapture as taught by Jesus. John 14, verse number one says, don't let your heart be troubled. I love that Jesus starts with that. Hey, I'm, 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 he's wanting to comfort. He's wanting to give this, this teaching, this doctrine, this understanding to his disciples and then on down the generations now to us as recorded for us in scripture. And he's wanting this to be an encouragement. He's, he's wanting to, to give us the confidence that, that we don't have to have troubled hearts during this time. We can look to Him and be confident in this promise that He is giving here. It says, believe in God, believe also in me. So you need to believe in God's plan. You need to believe in God's purpose. Believe in God's will 
for this earth and how it's all going to bring him glory. And Jesus says, hey, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, he says, verse 2, are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? So if this was not true, if this isn't a reality, Jesus is saying, would I have told you that I'm going to go and prepare a place for you? If, if this isn't true, why would I tell you then that I'm going to go prepare a place for you? In my Father's house, there are many rooms. That's the reality. And Jesus says, because I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you, that makes it true. Because he spoke it, he promised it with his words to the disciples recorded for us in scripture. And now for us to read and understand, he is saying, I told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you, which makes everything true. It makes this teaching here, this doctrine true. Look at verse 3. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself. You can almost read that uh, conditionally. If I go away. Did Jesus go away? Yes, he did. He ascended and is seated now at the right hand of the Father. And it says here, if I go away, that's been accomplished, and prepare a place for you, we know that's the reality because Jesus said that's what he was going to do. So if I go away, he says, and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. Jesus says, hey, if all of these things are true that I'm telling you, if, if there are many rooms in my father's house, I've told you that. I've told you I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And because I have spoken to you all of these, these truths, you know that this teaching now is true. It is 100% true. If I go then, if I go away, he says, that's been accomplished, and prepare a place for you, then the next event is also true. The next event then, the imminent event on the the Bible prophecy timeline is Jesus says, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am currently preparing a place where there are many rooms in his father's house, where he is, he is going to take us to be with him there. He says, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. Many teach a post-tribulation rapture. That's the idea that Jesus comes back and, and right before his feet hit the ground, right before his second coming when he uh, makes physical contact and lands on the earth again, right before that, uh, Christians are going to meet him in the air, um, be transformed and given their glorified uh, immortal bodies. And then we will make this U-turn and return to the earth with Christ. That basically says Jesus is, is coming back during his second coming. He's going to call us up into the air. We're going to meet him there. We're going to turn around and we're going to come right back down to this earth. That goes against what he teaches here in John 14, 1 through 3. He says, if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again, take you to myself, he says, so that where I am, am you may be also why would jesus go and prepare a place why would jesus tell the disciples here hey in my father's house are many rooms why would he make sure that they understood that reality that that physical reality if we were not intended to go and take part in what and where he has been preparing for us and I believe this teaches, John 14, 1 through 3, 
that Jesus is going to come back, take us to himself, and we are going to go to heaven so that we can be with him during the time of Jacob's trouble, during the 70th week of Daniel. I believe that's why Jesus is preparing a place for us for that time so that he can accomplish his plan, his purpose, his will for this earth, focusing in on Israel and entering into judgment with all of those nations, all of those people um, who are on the earth at that time who, who defy him, who oppose him, who reject him. Um, and if we read through the book of Revelation, we begin to understand there are significant things happening in heaven during the time of Jacob's trouble during that 70th week. There is a coronation ceremony, a throne room ceremony. There is a trumpet ceremony. There are all of these things that I believe we are going to take part in as we worship Christ, as we recognize him as, as the one worthy to um, open the scroll, to undo the seals, as we begin to worship Him in person, um, I believe that is all taking place while uh, the, the 70th week, the, the time of Jacob's trouble is happening here on the earth and the focus zooms in on and con concentrates in on uh, Israel, um, focusing in you know, further, zooming in further on Jerusalem and what's happening there. Uh, the Antichrist um, and what's happening in the temple, the abomination of desolation, everything that is happening during that seven-year period of time. Um, what's interesting, it says, if I go away, so we understand this, and, and the, the beautiful part of this is Jesus says, hey, I'm going to ask my Father and to give you another counselor, to give you the Holy Spirit. Um, and if we understand that, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14, the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of His glory. So when we begin to understand the significant role of the Holy Spirit during this time, and the physical, think about this, the physical absence of our Savior, Jesus has ascended and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Uh, he is preparing a place for us. In His absence, He says, Hey, I'm going to ask the Father to send you the Counselor, the Holy Spirit. Uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit has been given to us. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And Paul makes it very clear for us there uh, in Ephesians that the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession. So the Holy Spirit is, is significantly working in the lives of of followers of Jesus Christ, uh, a spiritual guide leading and guiding us into all truth through the Word of God, sanctifying us, uh, connecting us spiritually with Christ so that we are seated with Him in heavenly places, um, teaching us, um, growing us, sanctifying us, stripping us of ourselves, and, and really working in our lives to conform us more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. So this is all happening while Jesus has gone away and is preparing a place for us. And then when the Father tells him, hey, it's time, he is going to come back for his bride, for his church, and he is going to take us to, to himself so that we may be where he is also, so that we may be with him, so that we can be with him physically united with him in heaven, in that place that He has been preparing for us. Uh, we're going to be there for a short time while He is focusing in on, again, and, and, and looking at or, or concentrating in on the people of Israel and this world, the people of this earth who have defied Him and rejected Him, entering into judgment with them. Um, and all of that happens before His second coming. So, how then does that, that moment in time take place? Well, Paul teaches us that so clearly in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Starting in verse 13, it says, We do not want you 
to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, those who have died, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And I've said this before, how is he going to bring with him those who have fallen asleep if they're not with him? If we don't understand that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. And then in verse 15, he says, For we say this to you by a word from the Lord. In other words, Paul is saying, hey, Jesus taught this most significant, most important doctrine of the rapture of the church. He is saying, we are saying this to you. We are teaching you this by a word from the Lord, from Jesus. He taught this. Many want to take this and say, okay, that goes back then to the Olivet Discourse, and that must be teaching not of a rapture, not of, not of a pre-tribulational rapture, but of the second coming. I believe what Paul is pointing back to, the teaching that he is pointing back to is John 14, 1 through 3. That was a significant teaching point in the lives of the disciples. It was recorded for us by the gospel writer there, the apostle John. We are learning from that, that that doctrine teaches very clearly that Jesus has gone away, is preparing a place for us, and because of that truth, because of that reality, He is going to come back for us, take us to be with Himself so that we can be where He is. We will be with Him. So Paul is saying here, for we say this, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15, for we say this to you by a word from the Lord. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's speaking of them being reunited with their physical bodies. There's that resurrection, that glorification moment. That's 1 Corinthians 15, being changed uh, in the twinkling of an eye, that, that momentary, that instantaneous change. That's the significance of 1 Corinthians 15. It's talking about in the twinkling of an eye, in that moment, we are changed. We, we take off the, the, the mortality that we live in and we put on immortality, uh, incorruptibility, that happens in the moment of uh, the twinkling of an eye. It's a rapid change. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about. Uh, many use that passage to say, well, that's the, 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 the speed or, or the, the realistic speed there of the rapture of the church. That's not what 1 Corinthians 15 is saying. 1 Corinthians 15 is saying, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. The, 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 the thing that happens very quickly um, in that passage is changing or, or being transformed from mortal to immortal. That's the significant change that happens there. And Paul says the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. So from that point in time and on, we will be physically reunited or physically united with Jesus. We will finally see Him physically face to face. If we think about this now, we are spiritually united with Him because of the Holy Spirit because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It says, uh, Romans 8, that we are in Christ. Um, and because we are in Christ, uh, it says that we are seated with Him. Uh, in another place in Scripture, we are seated with Him in, in heavenly places. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, we are seated with Him in Christ in heavenly places. So spiritually, we are united with Christ 
through the Spirit um, right now, but physically we are separated from Him. This moment in time that Paul is talking about here in 1 Thessalonians 4 is about our physical uh, uniting with Christ, being united with Him physically, and we will be with Him forever. We will always be with the Lord from that point in time and on. And Paul says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another with these words. These are words of encouragement. These are words that are supposed to uh, edify and build up and encourage and, and give us confidence as we look forward to the return of Jesus, as we look forward uh, to Him coming back for His church and being caught up with Him in the air. Uh, we, we, we do look forward to the return of Christ. We know that this is a truth uh, that you cannot deny. Um, you know, if you study the Bible, if you study Scripture, you cannot deny that the rapture is a literal event. You cannot deny the rapture of the church. The rapture is there. I was listening to something the other day, and they said there's about 26% now of Christians who deny a literal rapture. And it was 30-something percent um, that believe in a pre or hold to a pre-tribulational rapture. Um, and then there's, you know, smaller percentages that are broken up that begin to explain the rapture in other ways. Um, but I just thought that alarming that 26 percent, there's more than, you know, it's a growing number of Christians, followers of Jesus, are denying that the rapture is a literal, future, biblical, prophetic event. Um, and I'm just, I, I find that hard really to accept, to understand if we begin to look at Scripture and if, if this is taught and this is preached and this is, you know, really expounded on, um, you know, from the pulpit and, and by pastors in churches today, if we begin to teach these things, it, it is supposed to be for our encouragement, for our edification. It is supposed to you know, lift up our spirits. It's supposed to uh, point us to the future, you know, unification or uniting with Christ physically. I just, I, I, I can't imagine what that is going to be like. And again, that is an imminent event, meaning it will happen at any moment. Um, and I look forward to that. I was talking to my kids about this. My kids are they are really just loving this doctrine. And my daughter asked, hey, dad, do you think, you know, that the rapture of the church will happen in our lifetime? And I said, you know, baby girl, looking around the world at the events, it's, it's really interesting to watch how things have been accelerated. Um, and I do believe that God is putting pieces in place to accomplish, again, his will, plan, purpose for this earth. And I just don't see how much longer um, we will be here. I really don't. Um, but then again, it could be another 50. It could be another 100 years. It could be another 200 years. Uh, the long sufferingness of our God is something that we just, we don't fully comprehend. We scratch the surface um, at that. We have to understand always the, the heart of our God, the desire of our God is that all will be saved. Uh, he does not desire or, or want that, that anyone would perish, but that all would come to, to repentance, uh, that all would come to a place of calling on the name of Jesus and being saved. So if I know that's the goal and plan and purpose of our God, that's His heart, um, then I have to be just confident and waiting for His return and His timing uh, of the rapture his timing of his return, coming back for the church, is completely up to him. Um, and Jesus says, you know, the angels, not even, not even the Son knows, only the Father knows. So I, I do believe that Jesus is waiting um, for that word, that final word, hey, go get your bride. Um, and I, I do believe it's, it's um, well, I do believe it's, you know, it's soon. I just don't know when. Um, I do believe it's imminent. Let's just say that. It is an imminent event, meaning it can happen at any moment. Um, Titus chapter 2, I love this. Verse number 11, it says, For the grace of God has appeared, 
bringing salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lust and to live in a sensible, righteous, uh, and godly way in the present age. That's how we're to live right now. While we wait, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that, folks, is what we are doing. We are living uh, in a way that is pleasing to God, submitting to His authority, learning to follow Him, learning to you know, submit to the, the, the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit in our lives while we wait for Christ's return, while we wait for the appearance of His glory, while we wait for Him to come back for His church. Um, and that is referred to by many as the blessed hope. And I, I really like that. I'm really encouraged by that. I think it's just such a, a beautiful understanding of Scripture. Uh, that that is something that we should be looking forward to as the church, uh, as Christians. We should be constantly looking forward to meeting Jesus face to face and knowing that He is going to bring with Him those who have died, those who are in Christ and have died, have passed away. He's going to bring them with Him. That's going to be a a beautiful reunion for many, many, many Christians. Many Christians are going to see Jesus uh, for the first time face to face. Finally, we'll see him as he is. We'll, We'll get to look upon his physical appearance and see him for who he is. And because of his love, he brings with him those who are dead who have died in Him, who are Christians and have passed away. He brings with Him those people and reunites them with their loved ones. I just think that's such a significant piece of that that just speaks to the the compassion, uh, the gentleness, the mercy, the love, the grace of our God. Uh, It's just so amazing to think about. Um, Again, Just to summarize, when we look at the doctrine of the rapture, we have to understand John 14, 1 through 3 teaches, Jesus teaches the doctrine of the rapture. He teaches that He has gone away, He is preparing a place for us, and because of that reality, He is going to come back for us and take us to be with Him. Paul says, 1 Thessalonians 4, from that moment in time on, we will be with Him always. I love that. That is a promise that I hold on to. I look forward to that. When we understand the 70th week of Daniel, the purpose of that final uh, week, that final week dealing with Daniel, his people, uh, the Israelites, uh, zooming in on the city, the holy city there, Jerusalem, all of that timeline in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, was given to the Israelites and is about their, um, their city, Jerusalem. If I understand that, then that final 70th week has to be all about them as well. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a time when God focuses in on Israel. And if I understand the first 69 weeks were about Israel, we're about the Jewish people, we're about the land uh, and the place of Israel and Jerusalem, I also have to accept the reality then, the 70th week has to be focused in on the Israelites, the Jewish people, uh, the nation of Israel, that, that geographical location, and Jerusalem, focusing in on Jerusalem. And I have to understand that, um, which is why I believe that Jesus is going to come back for His bride He's going to take us to be with Him, and then all His attention and focus will be in on Israel and the peoples of this earth who directly oppose, reject, and defy Him. Um, There's many other teachings on this. There's many other viewpoints on this. Again, um, I'm scratching the surface on a pre-tribulational rapture position. Um, There's understanding that we are not uh, intended to endure the wrath of God, 
There's understanding that in 1 Thessalonians and how Paul teaches that very clearly. Um, there's also the doctrinal uh, rapture, doctrinal opinion of, of mid-tribulation and a uh, pre-wrath uh, tribulational or a pre-wrath rapture position. Um, and those you can read about, you can look through those and study those and understand those. Um, and, and folks that hold to those, again, followers of Jesus Christ, Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ who hold to those positions, uh, defend those with the Word of God. So you just have to understand that. Um, and you have to be willing to sit down and study the Word of God, allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you in your studies of the rapture, but hold on to the rapture. Encourage one another with these things. We are waiting for the appearance of our Savior. He's coming back for His bride. Um, and I believe that wholeheartedly. Um, I am confident in that. Um, I want to just share with you a couple of resources. First of all, this, this book is The Falling Away. Uh, the Falling Away, uh, Spiritual Departure, or physical rapture. And this is by Dr. Andy Woods. It's 40 something pages. It's a short read. It's a very good uh, teaching tool and learning tool for us. Um, it goes over 2 Th Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 3. This is a 40 something page book on one single verse, um, really zooming in on one word, the apostasy, uh, the Greek word there, apostasia. Um, and if that means, um, you know, rebelling or falling away spiritually, or if that means the rapture of the church. Um, and Dr. Andy Woods gives some great insight to that, some great teaching on that. I would recommend um, just ordering this book. I'll put a link to it in the description of this video so that you can grab that book. Another book by Don Stewart. He's a Calvary Chapel pastor. Uh, he's done a lot of good teaching. Uh, the Rapture and the Blessed Hope of the Church. The Rapture, the Blessed Hope of the Church. This is a, a good book, a great resource. Um, you may not agree with Don Stewart. You may not agree with um, everything that he says, but what he does objectively, I believe, in this book is he lays out all of the different doctrinal opinions, um, the doctrinal positions of the rapture, and he informs the reader, um, educates the reader really on all of those different uh, rapture understandings and teachings. Um, he holds to a pre-trib rapture of the church, and he's very clear about that, but he does objectively present all of the different viewpoints that's why this book, I think, is just such a great resource to have because you can go to it, you can flip right to that chapter and say, okay, what is a mid-trib rapture position? What is a pre-wrath rapture position? What is a post-trib rapture position? Uh, and he um, articulates that very clearly in this book and helps the reader to understand and be educated on this so that we can have conversations all pointing back to the Bible all getting us diligently to study the Bible. So that's why I love the, um, that book, and it's been such a help for me. Um, so I'll put those links in the description of this video. I hope this has encouraged you and helped you. Um, the rapture, again, a hot button topic, but something we should not shy away from. In fact, we should talk about the rapture more. Like I said, I'm talking about this with my kids. Uh, one of my sons says, hey, dad, I had a dream about the rapture the other day. I just think that's so cool to begin to teach them to look forward to meeting their Savior, meeting our Savior Jesus face to face in the air. I just think that's going to be such a, an amazing, beautiful time. Um, so I hope this has helped. Thank you.